uh, sorry about that. I, I don't know. I, I didn't completely take in the email. I was, I was foolish. No, but no, no. I, <laughs> don't know why. No, sorry, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. You know, we, we this Sunday is, morning and all. Yeah, exactly. Gareth and I, we always have a laugh because we, without fail, like there's always like a bit of a glitch for the first 10 or 15 minutes um, yeah. because it's either like the earphones don't work or the Zoom link doesn't work or something. It's like, it's every time the same. <laughs> well, yeah, morning. let's overcome the tech. Yes, good yeah. morning. So yeah, man, nice to see you, buddy. I love, I love that you have Mandela behind you. It's you cool, know, man. It's, 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 you know, almost every home in South Africa has a Mandela picture in it. But somehow he just transcended political lines, party lines. It's just everyone has a picture. Black, yeah. white, colored. It's yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, it's amazing God. how one human can like make yeah. such a big difference, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our history That's could nice. have been entirely different without him. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is that someone so else crazy. negotiating that transition? Cheapest. Uh, imagine what that outcome could have been. Yeah. Yeah. You're around there today. Where are you now at the moment, actually? At, I uh, am sitting in my apartment in Cape Town that has an incredible view of the uh, oh. mountain and lion's head. Yes, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You still speak a bit of Dutch? You know, I was totally fluent. Um, yeah. It's amazing how kids just pick it up. And then it ruined yeah. my Afrikaans. They came back because the grammar is different for Dutch. Totally. <laughs> it ruined my Afrikaans. Yeah. But I never really recovered. And it also ruined, and Afrikaans ruined my Dutch. And I can't speak either. <laughs> yeah, but I know exactly that feeling. Eh? <laughs> uh, that's good. Waking at dawn. All right, so we're here with Donovan Marsh. How's it going, Donovan? Thanks for coming on the show with us. Pleasure, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're really excited to chat to you. We're uh, super grateful to Georgie for putting us in contact, All and right. we're uh, yeah, we're looking forward to to getting into the nitty gritty with you about what you do. So. But obviously, we find that uh, yeah, people often associate others with what they currently do. Um, but we always like to hear about you know the other side of what they do and and see how people got to where they are now. So to do that, we'll take things back for to when you were a youngster. So tell us a little bit about growing up in uh, the infamous Joburg and uh, what was life like for you then. Well, I had a, a crazy childhood because I grew up in many countries in the world. My father worked for Shell. It's a petrol company, um, and they just moved it every two years. So I was actually born in Swaziland, um, and then I moved to Joburg, and then I moved to Cape Town, then I moved to Holland, then I moved to England, then I came back to Cape Town, then I moved to Joburg, and now I've moved back to Cape Town. So I was all over the map, um, um, but that just suited me fine. I was a solitary child, I was an independent child, and I created my own fun wherever I was. I was always a creator of drama, um, even when I was just two years old, and that you know came to bear in my adulthood. <laughs> and uh, were, were you, do you, so you don't count yourself as like a Joburg boy or have any of oh, the, no, I, the words? I actually count myself like, as a Cape Town boy because yeah. I, I, that's where I went to school. So I went to, to high school and junior school uh, in Holland and Cape Town. So, so that's kind of what my base is. And I've always considered myself a Cape Townian. And when I'm here in Cape Town, I always identify with the people here. They're kind of similar to me. You know, yeah. So I feel at home here. That's cool, man. And you mentioned uh, school in Cape Town and you went to quite an infamous school in Cape Town called Bishops. And uh, is, <laughs> is, is, that, is that like, it's also, is, is, from what we know, is like quite a religious school. Is, were your parents religious at all? Or is it just because it's a good school that you went to? It? It's an Anglican school. Uh, I went to chapel every day of my life. Well, <laughs> wow. um, I was a solid atheist from the age of about 11. <laughs> <laughs> I remember someone explaining religion to me when I was 11. And I was like, so what? <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, and so, and, I, and I, I have a steadfast in my belief from that day on. Um, uh, and I went to Bishops because it was a great school. Uh, and certainly not because it was... Uh, I tried to make chapel voluntary. It was my, uh, my mission. It <laughs> was a goal. Uh, yeah, it was my goal and I failed badly. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's one way to cure a kid of, of religion is to make him go to chapel every day. Uh, yes, definitely. I can imagine. So what did you, like, how yeah. was that experience just sitting there, like, every time? Were you just, like, twiddling your thumbs and just thinking? It deeply offended my sense of drama because chapel is about repetition. Imagine you're going to see the same movie every day for, like, <laughs> yeah. So that's what it is. It's the same thing. They say the same stuff. You sing the same song in the same place, the same boring people. It's just, it's so undramatic. The church really needs to up their game if they want to win people. <laughs> so, there but, was I mean, no, what about their big hats, brother? 
Yeah, they need they need they need new hats. <laughs> yeah, totally. So so you they need went a variety of hats. You, you didn't want to go and sing in the choir or anything like that. <laughs> I auditioned for the choir. They said no, thank you in the first ten seconds. Singing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's classic. <laughs> uh, funny man. So uh, bishops is actually one of four schools in the world that offers an annual road scholarship to ex pupils uh, to oh, attend the uh, University of Oxford. Was that like a th- big thing at school where people like? trying to like do their best and what have you to try and get, get hold of that? You couldn't really, it, it, it's an interesting thing. The way they did it at Bishops, and I don't know if they do it like this at other schools, is you are nominated by the boys and by the teachers. Um, and I don't know if it's got that much to do with your academic achievements. Um, and so I think every year, so 10 boys get shortlisted and then you've got to go and achieve certain things in the world and then uh, sort of postgraduate. Uh, and then you can qualify for for a post. Sorry, then you can qualify for a postgraduate Oxford degree. Uh, I was actually shortlisted. I was one of the ten boys, or however many boys it was. Um, but then I didn't have this. You know, I didn't go to. A, I didn't do an amazing degree, and I didn't have a cum laude result. And so then I couldn't qualify. Mm-hmm. But uh, my best friend actually ended up being the Rhodes Scholar from my year, and he, he went out. No hmm. ways. That's so and cool. what kind of things do they kind of ask of you to do after school? Are there certain tasks or? I think you've got to have an incredible degree. You've got to, it's got to be cum laude. You've got to succeed or you've got to go straight into the workplace and do something pretty exceptional. Um, and then you can apply and then you are selected against everyone else who applies for that year, which could be anybody, not necessarily someone from your year. Um, and then I think ah. they, choose, they choose one. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So interesting how the world it's it's so interesting how the world works because when Craig sent out like you know some of the questions that we'd like to ask you, uh, he 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 just asked the one now about Rhodes Scholar and I'm like, did you read the the storyboard I've sent for our guest tomorrow because he's actually a Rhodes Scholar himself <laughs> and um, like you said he yeah. I think he had to study a well he studied a law degree and did all these other things and it's just uh, interesting the criteria to actually get that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you uh, you studied like I think a bit of drama and stuff at school, but you also wanted to be a psychiatrist, and I think you enrolled to medical school. Is there any reason you could go down that route? I did. Look, Bishop was an amazing school. They had a theatre. They actually built that theatre, and when I arrived on my first year, um, and they made things that weren't rugby cool. You know, in a school like Bishop's, <laughs> such a rugby school. Uh, it was kind of uncool to be good at academics, you know, but we had an amazing headmaster arrive and he made it cool uh, and he built the theater and it was just, it was, yeah, it was no longer sort of, it was, wasn't just the kids who were, who were frowned upon doing those activities. And so I kind of found my voice within that, but it wasn't a real thing. It was just something you did on the side and you know, it wasn't going to be a career or anything. Um, and I was also, I loved biology and I loved the sciences and I was, I was, I was the star people in biology. I actually think I won the biology prize. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was fascinated by medicine and I want to get into it, particularly psychology and psychiatry, which is really what movie making is anyway. It's, 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 it's a different kind of psychology uh, and you need to be strong in that area to make good film. You need to understand human behavior so you can depict it realistically. Um, and storytelling is really just the psychology of humanity, uh, reflected within a story and the fight between good and evil is, is actually the fight between good and evil within us. And that's why stories work so far. They talk to our inner psychology. So there, there was a connection. I just didn't see it at that time. And I wanted to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, um, and, and to follow through on my biology aptitude. And so I applied to medical school and uh, my, my good friend at the time, Johnny Lowe, also applied to medical school. He went on to be the CEO of Adcock Ingram. <laughs> wow. <laughs> became a doctor and then specialized in anesthetics and so on. And I went totally different route. I just suddenly realized <laughs> this is going to be dreadfully boring and dull. And, and, I, and when I reflected back on what I loved about school, it was nothing to do with biology, even though I was good at it. It was everything to do with theater, and dram- drama and creative expression. Um, wow. And because I was very strong in the sciences, it was just filmmaking. It was just a great, because it's a combination of the tech as well as the soul or the art, shall we say. Um, and filmmaking was just a natural thing for me to go in. And I actually saw a making of when I was 16. Um, and I, you know, making ofs we see now all the time, but at that time there were no making ofs. <clears throat> I didn't really know how a movie was made. This is 1986. Um, and in 1986, I saw the making of a never ending story. Um, 
And I was, so, mm. and I just remember being so blown away by that and thinking that is absolutely something I could do. And, and, and I never wavered from that moment. Well, I still applied to medical school, so I was obviously wavering a bit. Um, <laughs> but once I decided I wanted to be a film director, that's, I never looked back. That's what I became. Yeah. Wow. How, how yeah, many times have you, have you seen Never Ending Story? <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite films i don't know i don't love watching movies more than once or twice um and, I, and most movies disappoint me I, I, some of my favorite movies of all time i watch for the second time and i don't enjoy them <laughs> uh, and, and and so I, I kind of hesitant to watch movies i love more than once but I, you know i should actually go back and watch it and see if it holds up yeah, um, yeah. i think um, i must have watched it 10 times or even oh, really? more as yeah. a kid yeah what a great movie, what a great movie. Yeah. And I how did, they, how did they make that big white? Uh, I forget his name now. Um, the the dog. Uh, <laughs> it was mostly, it was mostly, I think it was mostly puppetry at that time. Ah, wow. so there was no VFX or CGI at that, uh, in those years, and it was all done with puppets. Wow! Uh, <laughs> very convincing. Yeah, no, it was great. And, and, and talking about favorite movies, what what are some of your favorite movies? I always get asked that. <laughs> <laughs> um. I could talk about influential movies, you know. I, I think for a young person, even today, uh, maybe not today, maybe social media has taken over this role, but just remember back in the 80s, you, you must, uh, if you took a kid from today and you stuck them back in the 80s, they'd probably feel like they're living in a blackout. <laughs> so there's no Facebook, TV is at certain hours, there's nothing on demand. Um, you know, it's just a couple of movies playing at sort of select times, not any time during the day. Uh, and, and so you really start for cultural input from the world. And I certainly only got them from movies. And so you, you almost grow up with movies. Movies teach you what it is to be human. And it teaches you about human potential. And it teaches you about worlds that you've never seen. Um, and so I was deeply influenced by those kind of movies when I was young. Um, and it started, I'll tell you where it started. It started with, I don't, do you remember? I think they were Australian. It was Terence Hill and Bud Spencer. Do you remember them? Oh, no. Uh, what, what was they doing? You guys are probably too young. They had these sort of slapstick comedy films. Um, but I actually went back to watch them. I, and I used to watch them when I was six or seven. So these are the first films that I, that I couldn't tear my eyes off. <laughs> um, and because slapstick comedy went done well at the Chaplin level. Chaplin, no one thinks Chaplin is a slapstick comedian, but he is, and so is Buster Keaton. But these were the guys, I didn't see that. I saw these guys called Bud Spence and Terence Hill, these slapstick comedians who were actually damn brilliant. And I actually went back to watch it. And the timing and the creation, and again, no special effects, and they do their own stunts. Um, and that's what got me hooked. And then I was hooked to a movie. And it was my other world, it was my world away from the world. And, and, and my problem as a kid was boredom. I was always so, Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yes. I yeah. <laughs> I was so fucking bored the whole time. Um, and movies showed me a world where I was never bored. I was always in thrall. This is a movement that I could actually maybe do something that w would mean I was never bored. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I've totally got an tangent from your question one of my favorite movies. But, <laughs> <laughs> but go, go back and watch the Bud Spencer Terrence Hill movies. It's just slapstick comedy, but for kids, it's amazing. And then eventually, I got your Chaplin and Buster Keaton, which you, sh you should really watch. They hold up, Buster Keaton particularly. I mean, you'll watch that and you'll still shake your head in disbelief and how brilliant it is. And this is, you know, made in the 19, early 1900s. Um, Have you seen the, the Laurel and Hardy? Uh, the, the new movie I was coming not out so, and the new movie coming out I was never so thrilled about the original stuff somehow I didn't I don't know I wasn't buying it I felt the same about the Three Stooges and these are sort of the classic comedian uh, and I have a strong comedy vibe in me and, and I just haven't actually made enough comedy films and that's my desire to actually become a comedy so I feel it's the purest of art so it's the hardest like if it doesn't work they don't laugh so it's, there's a pure way to, to know whether you've succeeded or not is yeah. the drama, you're never really quite sure, and it means different things to different people, but laughter is universal. Um, and so, again, I'm going on a tangent here, but um, I, I believe they're making new Laurel and Hardy. They made a sort of modern day Three Stooges as well, which is straight slap to comedy, which I wasn't a fan of. Really <laughs> it didn't, I didn't believe it. it, didn't turn I out. Believe it. Yeah, I've got to believe it. Comedy is about belief for me. I've got to believe it. It's got to be plausible. 
I've got it, you know, and then, and then you've got to have a funny bone. You've got, you've got to be able to spit. <laughs> um, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you, you mentioned, yeah, you sorry. go, no, go. Oh, no, no, you, I just wanted, you, you mentioned storytelling and it's just yeah. interesting as well that like how in the modern world, like with marketing and everything, they've taken so much of that concept from movies and stuff and, and translated that into like, you know, just marketing and, and other areas uh, of like, Advertising, uh, yes. yeah, and advertising and stuff. It's it's really interesting how they've how that's all happened, hey. Yeah, in fact, they you know, advertising tried to take sort of Freudian concepts of, of how we're going to sell this product to you without just shoving the product in your face, because that clearly that's how they used to advertise and didn't work very well. And so mm-hmm. they they got into the sort of uh, the psychoanalytic model, which is really where storytelling came in, and then they kind of used the the storytelling model of the ancient Greeks. And once you combine all these elements, you can get to a very powerful place where you can talk directly to people's psychology um, in the way that music does. And music just, you know, in a magical way, just cuts right through everything and it hits you at an emotional level. There's immediately, you know, you hear a song and you're just emoting, even though you're not quite sure why. Um, and, and advertising tries to take this. I don't think very successfully, I think most adverts just do it in the most terrible, sentimental. I don't think they've fully understood the power of what they're doing. Um, I think they're starting to get it now. Advertising seeping into movies. Advertising start in films. Because classical, the classical advertising model is, is dead. It's a video on demand. Um, mm. you know, ad breaks are, are gone. You know. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I find it very irritating that YouTube has ad breaks. Yeah, yeah. tell me about it. I hate it's it. Crazy. Yeah, I think it's and it's just stupid. It's obviously not the way to do it. You know, you got to you got to integrate it into the content. Um, yeah. And, and make it cool. You know. Um, yeah. But that's their way of making money, yeah. isn't it? Sorry. It is their way of making money, but they've just got to, they've got to get better at it because it's so irritating. Yeah. Um, actually, I think does those products a disservice because you just carry your irritation of that, that interruption onto yeah. the product. So you, you, you've got an irritated feeling as the break comes and, and then you see the product name and that irritated feeling and the product name are going to get associated. And that's exactly what they're trying not to do. They're trying to try to fool you emotionally to actually get you to associate. Um, a good feeling with their product. And so I don't know what you I guess like, you know, the influences on Instagram and all that are, are, are sort of That's a way fair, of yeah. trying to do that in a way of like you wearing those clothes, but in a, yeah. you know, some other provocative photo. <laughs> and then... Yeah, you've, uh, got, you've got to integrate it into the entertainment. Otherwise, people are, I, I, people are cynical as well, I think. And they're just not... I, I find adverts just everywhere. I billboards. I find them so, so transparently trying to persuade me of something you know I, I, I don't know how they I mean, who's dumb enough to look at an adver- advert and not see that they're being sold you know, you've got to be very smart to try and sell someone something who knows they're being sold because they, they know you're it's like being a con man but you're showing your cards <laughs> yeah but but i also think you coming from it from a different angle because oh. you're so aware of this <laughs> you're so aware of it like um, uh, um, that's for sure I but you guys I mean, you guys no. i mean you you feel like you're immune to advertising? Do you have that sense that you don't, you're unconvinced by advertising? Um, yeah, in a way, like we're, I think we're more aware of it now, like because we've been, we've been like over the years, I guess, studying the psychology around it. So, you know, just the, the, the hero's journey, this, the story, the just being aware of what people are actually trying to do to you for sure. Um, yeah. We've become much more aware of it. So no matter what feel-good message they're trying to sell you, that's going to sit un- undercut it. I find kids today, particularly kids that go and see movies, man, they are, they are so, it's hard to take them down a road or, or pull the wool over their eyes. I mean, they, um, they, they don't show them anything sentimental or try and sort of get them to feel in any kind of direct way. I'll just be like, oh man, what is this? <laughs> you know, you've got to be so smart about how you make an audience feel. Otherwise, yeah. they just got to get their back up. And yeah. What is this yeah, thing? people can, can smell the bullshit very, very quickly these oh, yeah. days. And yeah, you've you got to be like, length smart about it. But I guess kids are, the advertising is changing so much. I mean, you've got a little youngster now and, you know, I guess you see it clearly with her. Like, they obviously get some form of advertising along the way, but how, how does it, you know, it's still affecting her in some way? Yeah, look, she's two, so she's just on the total receiving end of everything. <laughs> she doesn't really yeah. know what's, even Fair enough. Or not, you know, I think she looks at a piece of communication and it's just like looking at life. So, <laughs> but I'd be interesting to watch her sort of uh, how she evolves, given that she she can only really take my phone and um, 
swipe onto YouTube, select a video, watch it, see what videos are associated to it, choose one, watch it. This is a, someone who's just turned two. You can't, wow. really, you can't really speak, but you can do that. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, the, the advertising is not far behind, you know, when, when, yeah. you, when, when that's happening, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, it's, it's waiting in the wings. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just taking things um, back a little bit. So after school, you went and studied at WITS and also in London. Um, how were those years for you uh, as, you know? In... Worst years of my life. <laughs> uh, I loved school. I, I just loved Bishops. It was just a perfect environment. All I did at Bishops was play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Every moment I could get. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, yeah. played the game. <laughs> But I always wanted to be the dungeon master. I couldn't see the fun in being a, a role player. Um, <laughs> I was the dungeon master. I created my own adventures. So that was just epic for me. And then I did theater and I, yeah, I, was, I was good academically. So I'd say it was all around school was amazing. I was never bored. I was at boarding school. I had a million friends. And then I decided foolishly to go to drama school at Vitz, um, which was where all these kind of hippie kids were. And it was just totally not my vibe. I, I wanted, I should have gone to film school. There were no film schools in South Africa at that time. Um, but it's kind of had a TV school, which is kind of why I went there instead of UC, UCT or anywhere else. But I should have gone overseas. I should have gone to New York film school. And, and that's what I would suggest to kids. Like if you're really serious and you have the, the money, the dough, um, go to an international film school because you'll get connected. You'll get the right kind of tuition. Um, and you'll get out of this sort of little, little tiny, um, village called South Africa. Um, uh, and so I didn't have that opportunity. I didn't have the money to go overseas. And there wasn't a, there are great film schools in South Africa. Um, um, and so I went to Vitz drama school and I didn't have a great time at all. But I kind of made up for it by just doing millions of shows. I just did millions of theater productions. Uh, I just did as much stuff as I could do. So I made the most of it professionally. I guess I wasn't happy maybe personally. But I just threw that into my professional work. Um, and there were no lecturers that understood the film side of it, which I kept trying to bring up. I was like, let's make some movies. You know, the handy cams had just kind of come out at that time. Had they, 1988? When did handy cams come out? Jeez, the portable high eights. Yeah. It wasn't like this massive thing. And suddenly you could just walk around with I think they were just coming out at that time. Um, and so I, I, I sent the lectures. I can't, you know, like we're doing theater and stuff. Can't we like just film some stuff on it? And I, can't, I try to get that going. But we really had no one. It's very technical learning how to make the film. So just, maybe these days it's easier because of there's so many making jobs and so much sort of resources online. So imagine learning how to make a film. There's nothing online because there was no online. Um, the teachers were all theatrical. didn't really understand uh, a film. And so I, I just... We found this old theater light. I had one light, that's it. So I went out and I would just turn the light on and just push it at the actors and then I would just film them from wherever. <laughs> so I had no concept of angles or how to light a scene. And, I just, and so I started doing little film projects that were absolutely shocking. <laughs> um, the place I really didn't know what I was doing, and, but I was trying to learn this technical thing as I was going. And it took me four years, a drama degree was four years. It took me about four years to work out, okay, these different angles and angles actually cut together and other angles just don't cut together. There's all rules about how you can film. There's this line that you have to film on. Otherwise, it makes it look like people are jumping around the room um, um, because you're actually working in two dimensions and not three dimensions. So you've got this three-dimensional world. It's the first thing you've got to learn when you make a film. It's a three-dimensional world, but the screen is two-dimensional. Hmm. And so everything that is far away in the real world is now all on the same plane. I might be saying something blindingly obvious, but actually when you get out there and, and film, that is your biggest challenge, is how, to, is how to work in this 3D space in a 2D frame that is attractive and draws you in. Now, people are so good at it these days, you just take it for granted. You watch movies, it's all done well. Until you yourself go out and start taking some pictures and cutting them together and seeing how shit it looks. Nothing <laughs> yeah. matches and no eye lines are looking at each other and people looking left and then they're looking right and then all the action doesn't flow. It's actually tremendously tough at a technical level wow. just to get that grammar right. It's like, it's like learning to talk again. It's like learning, geez, okay, these, these shots when edited together create this instance or this motion or this feeling or this sense of movement. Um, and so I had to learn that all from scratch over four years of drama school. by trial and error really and reading what little books I could find. Um, um, and so that's what I, I learned at Vets. Basically what I learned at Vets is how not to make a movie. 
I just need to <laughs> shit. Oh. Those important lessons. Um, very important. And luckily, it was drama school where you're allowed to make shit movies and your career doesn't end. <laughs> yeah. um, just so, call it really uh, arty or something. You'll be right. Yeah, yeah. It's just it was really, really arty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, but I did a lot of theater. And so I learned a lot about acting and, and, and on the theater school was, was quite sophisticated. And there were some good people there. And, and I went to a lot of festivals with plays and so on and so forth. And that's, it's a great skill to, to learn acting at its purest, which is what you learn during theatre. So anyone, I would advise anybody who's interested in film to, when they're starting out, to also do theatre, because theatre is an acting medium only. You're talking about, again, you're in a 3D space with an actor on a stage, and once you've done your directing, which is what I do, you actually have to sit back at the key moment, which is the performance, which is the opposite of film. At the performance, you're involved. But in theatre, at the, at the performance, you've got to sit back and let the performer do it. Um, and that's uh, hard for anyone to do as a director to do. But you learn what acting is all about. So that's what I, that was the best thing about drama school at bits. I learned about acting, and, and I still consider myself a very strong uh, actor's uh, director. So I'm good at uh, directing actors. Well, I understand the process. I can talk to actors, and I, I know what they're going through because I've acted. So, I've done it. Um, so yeah, and then from there I went on to, to I went overseas. My parent, my father was living in London at the time. So I went and did a short course, just a six month proper film school. All I could afford was these little six months. Uh, and there is where I, I, I got taught by professionals and I really learned the technical side of film properly after trying and erring it for four years. Uh, I finally learned you know, what, what makes a good edit, what makes a good shot. And got an opportunity to work with some cool people and make a documentary in London. And that was, that was great. Hmm. Wow. I guess, you know, the whole fact of trial and error and doing it from the beginning to end, making all the balls ups and what have you along the way is actually very powerful because you, you just, you viscerally understand what works. Yeah. It's not just after you've read it a few times, you know, there's quite obviously a massive difference there. So I guess there's some, there's some value in that anyway. But so, so after you lived in, in, uh, in, in London and what have you, you also lived all around the world and all different places did, did these different cultures and, and people and, and things have an influence on the sort of the way you do things now? And, and did, you, did you get a whole new look on, on the whole industry when you were over there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting question about how one is affected by, by culture. Obviously, culture is who you are. Culture is what creates you. And I've found that now that I'm working in Hollywood and overseas, um, I get a lot of scripts uh, and I know when I'm reading the script, I, I could direct the hell out of this film, but actually it's about a world that I don't know. I had, I'm not from the Bronx. You know, if I'm reading a heist, well, I read a heist movie set in Los Angeles during the nineties, during the LA riots in the nineties. And I thought, geez, I can do, I can direct the hell out of this, but I don't know this world. And I felt uncomfortable about putting myself forward because I know that, the magic in movies and in the details and, and paying attention to getting just this little cultural things right. It's what gives the film believability and authenticity. And so ultimately, I felt uncomfortable making those films. Uh, and I did pitch for that film and I eventually did get it. And it was never made for its own reasons. But subsequent to that, I now turn down films where I don't feel I have a cultural hook into them. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm starting to realize that I, I need to make movies with a South African angle. Or with, or, with an, or with a very scientific angle, like, a, like something that isn't culturally specific, like a sci-fi movie that actually has its own world right. to create. But something that's very specifically, you know, Brazilian or very specifically American or set in Queens, or I, I, I don't feel comfortable making those films. And so now I just turn those scripts down straight up, even if I love them and think I can direct the hell out of them. I'm just like, you know, I'm not the right person for this because I haven't lived it. I don't, I haven't experienced it culturally. You know, I could go there. And spend some time there but i don't think it'd be the same you know mm. um yeah. and so i start to think you really need to to make movies in worlds that you understand or in worlds that are imagined yeah wow it's a really Excellent. important lesson i guess just to say no is when you yeah. you know you can't associate yourself with it or you can't be an expert at actually yeah, doing something can't. yeah yeah and you'll end up offending those people who've lived that reality you know and so mm. it's important to say no because it will whiplash on you eventually yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so when you eventually got into the film industry, what, what was your first job? Um, and in like over the years, which directors have been influential on you? Or is that not, not a thing? 
yeah, look, I've been influenced by directors, you know, the famous directors of the world. I was super influenced. I guess the, the, the director, directors who influenced me the most are the Coen brothers because mm. I kind of grew up with their movies and, and they, they made Blood Simple just at the time, just they were slightly ahead of me. I think they're probably, just how old are they? Probably about like five, 10 years older than I am. Um, and they were just having the career that I always wanted to have and I've never had. <laughs> um, <laughs> They were making movies, and I kind of watched them grow as filmmakers. I mean, now that's right on the arty end of the spectrum, but that's not where they started. They started making much more fun commercial films, um, and I saw, I watched them evolve, and, and I kept feeling, geez, those guys, like what they're doing is exactly how I do it. Uh, yeah. And I kind of feel the same with um, Darren Aronofsky as well, who's just, you know, obviously one of the greatest artists of all time, but his his sensibility, and, and I feel the same with Denis Villeneuve. But I watch their movies, I'm very much, oh, that's my sensibility. Ah, oh, that just speaks so directly to our, how I might have chosen to direct that scene. Um, um, and so they teach me and I learn from them, but they also reflect back to me kind of what my, what my cultural sensibility is. Or not only my cultural sensibility, just my artistic sensibility. What I respond to emotionally mm-hmm. is from a visual image or a piece of music or the way things are stitched together or, 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 or a bit of storytelling. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunities to really express myself in the way that those guys did. And hopefully that's coming for me still. Um, for sure. Um, but those are the directors that really influenced me. Now, I think that was your last question. There was a question. Was yeah. a question what, that question. What, what, what was your, f- your first job in the film industry? Oh, right. So, so yeah, so I, I got kicked out of London because I overstayed my visa. I had a six-month uh, uh, <laughs> student visa. No, quite strict. And I'd overstayed it. So I got scoffed out. <laughs> uh, I had my South African passport, so that was where I was headed. Um, and so I just went straight into it. My first job was a Trillion TV in Bar- it was Barry Herzog Drive. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, my job was VT. So back in the day, the, 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 the tapes were these huge, big uh, thing. The Umatic tapes were massive. They're bigger than a, than a computer, like a laptop. Um, and then they had these huge reel-to-reels, which were, which were like film, um, but they were actually video. Um, and there were these massive things, and they were very sensitive, and very, uh, you, you, you couldn't put them in a room that wasn't like, chilled to like three degrees. And so they, they were kept in an Icelandic room. But in the middle of the <laughs> summer, and my job was to sit in this, this Arctic room, with my massive <laughs> duffel coat on, with all these machines around me that were then connected via wires to the edit suites, to the various edit suites, and the editors would talk to me, that's it. Donovan put tape four on machine five, and then I was like, take this tape four, and I put it on machine <laughs> five. And then I press play, and then I'd wait, my coat shivering until I was told to put the next tape in. It was the worst job in the world. Um, oh, yeah. That was my first job in the, in the TV industry. I lasted, I think I lasted a few weeks. I just couldn't take it anymore. And I, I resigned. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And then I thought, bugger that, I, I want to direct. I'm just going to call myself a director and see what happens. Um, and then I, I got offered a job to, to edit. Actually, they called me in and they said, look, we're directing this documentary um, on, on, this, on the South African film industry, the documentary about the film industry. We've got a director, like, won't you? But he needs, a, he needs an assistant. So will you assist him? I was like, cool. And they said, well, that's just like a short job. But actually, what we need is an editor. Like, can you edit? And I was like, and I, and I, could, I mean, obviously, I understood editing, but I didn't know how to operate the machinery. Which again, it was a whole room full of machinery. These days, you can do it on your, on your phone. Um, <laughs> um, um, my day, you need a whole room of machinery. So he showed me into this room. And he said, Doc, can you, can you work this? Uh, and I, I noticed a pile of manuals in the corner. And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, great, you can start tomorrow. And I was like, oh, fine. <laughs> so, um, I grabbed the manuals and I just read them all and tried to work it all out. And I, and I worked it out. My first edit session was a total disaster. Um, and simultaneously to that, but I quickly learned the edit suites and I'm quite technical and so I worked it all out and it's, you know, I finally, I finally, I finally got quite good at it. Um, and then I went, I was assistant editor, assistant director on this, simultaneously on this documentary. And the director was entirely useless and actually didn't really care and didn't really know what he was doing at all. Um, and so I just started taking over and I just kept saying, well, don't you want me to just, do, I'll do this interview, or I'll, let me direct this scene. And he was like, okay, cool, because yes, you didn't care. <laughs> Um, and then when he saw that, I actually kind of did know what I was doing. Um, I, I started directing it. And I became director of that documentary. Um, and that was my first directing gig. Huh, well, wow. man, that's so cool. That's amazing. And yeah. was, you'd also been, um, in the earlier days, 
he'd worked on like big TV productions, like who wants to be a millionaire and gladiator. Oh, we had a, yeah. how, what, what is that experience? Like, are we, you know, were you, this is before you got into the sort of feature film kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. I look, I, I, there wasn't really a feature film industry in South Africa to speak of. Um, and I knew I wanted to get into drama and feature films. And for some reason, I just couldn't get a job on the dramas that were happening. And so I ended up doing commercials and corporate television. So I, I was directing corporate uh, uh, videos, I guess. Um, and I always try to give them a dramatic bent and have a bit of drama in them, and use actors. And, you know, it wasn't just, sort of, this is our business. This is what we do. I try to do something a bit more creative with them. So I was doing that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, when I, I'm, I was still visiting my parents in London. And when I visited them there, I saw this, this show called Gladiators. It was the number one show on television um, in, 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 in England and in America. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is, South Africa is just mad for this stuff. This is just going to work yeah. so well. So when I went back, the, the company I was working for, I, I said to this guy, look, let's look into the rights. I mean, you're young. You, you, to even think of doing gladiators in South Africa is actually just ludicrous. I, I, I don't, but being young, you don't really see the barriers to entry, right? You just think, oh, I, we could do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, not seeing this, how huge the show was and how, how technically difficult. And um, it's a massive show. It's got 14 cameras. It's, it's set in arenas. It's, it's tremendously dangerous. It's, <laughs> it's huge games that you play. They play them for real. It's not like WWF wrestling where it's all fake. It's all done for real. Um, anyway, I, I told my boss, the time, look, let's um, show the amazing South Africa, let's do it. And so he kind of humored me and phoned up whoever owned the rights, Vetro Golden Mayor actually owned the rights in America. And they were like, cool, you can have the rights uh, for a test run. And then, I don't know, there were certain dominoes that fell, and maybe just my over-enthusiasm. I was, I was 20, I must be 25. Um, and then he said, well, we need a director. I said, I'll direct it. I'm not going to a live show and cameras and, you know, all these events, which I knew really, very little about. Um, and so he was like, cool, fine, do it. And for some reason, we managed to convince Mnet at the time to do a test run of episodes. Um, and it was heading to be a massive disaster because we had no clue what to <laughs> do. Uh, we really, it was just heading in the wrong direction. And then I had a chat to the guy who was running it in London and I, and I, I explained to him what we were doing. And the London show was just unbelievable. It was just a super high production value show. And he said, hey, why don't you guys, we've actually got a week, why don't you come onto our set and like, we'll do it with you. Yeah, come on and we'll show you how to do it. And you'll just sort of shadow wow. us and bring all your athletes over and you use our amazing facilities because we've got this one week gap and we actually, maybe we'll do like a South Africa versus England show oh, and wow. like, just come over. And so we were like, okay. And thank God we did that because we like walked onto this incredible production. I just let, I just took it all in. I learned exactly what they did. I didn't have the pressure of having to do it myself. And I sat next to the British director and just watched him do it. And thank God, because I just realized what I was in for. I would have just, I would have sunk like a stone had wow. I not had this experience. But we were on the British set. It was just amazing. And we learned all how to do the show. And we left. We were there. We filmed for a week. But we were there for a month. Uh, and we came back to South Africa with all this knowledge, and then we were able to put on this amazing show in South Africa. We put on this incredible show. Um, it was number one for four years in South Africa. Jeez. We made, I think, 120 episodes. Um, 120? Wow. Yeah. Was it that many? Flip. Yeah, it was that many. It was massive. Wow. Um, the bar had set, been set super high there, and, and you yeah. brought that back. And it was a great show. Um, Jeez. It was a lot of fun. It was a formula. Yeah. I was set to just deliver it. But uh, it was great for, to do multicam and to do the big live events. And it was, it was a huge stepping stone in my career. Anyway, and I was very young. I mean, I was in my 20s. And so it's all just crazy. Yeah, that sounds so cool. But you just, you just like destroyed me there. You said WWF is not real. Like, <laughs> you mean The Rock and I think we all Michaels <laughs> and all these other side chat that I looked up to in my childhood are not real? You just you down Rock and, list, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but ah, uh, yes, yeah, I'm a bit. bit no, we used to, we used to, South <laughs> Africa had its version of WWF. I don't know if you guys probably don't remember this. So we had our own wrestling. I remember from when I was seven years old. I'm quite a bit older than you guys, but we used to have Young Vulcans and Bulusian were the two <laughs> South African wrestlers. They wore these these obscene X-rated spandex tights, <laughs> and they and and it was, it was like no production value. It was like some 
boxing ring, like with nothing. And they would just get in there and roll around. And then often Khan's commentator was like, yeah, come here, put us here, stop on me. And, and as a seven-year-old, I was like, this is amazing. And then, um, so yeah, so we had our own WWF. <laughs> Oh, that's classic. That's classic. Is, yeah. there, is there much difference between filming TV and actual films? Well, it depends. We're talking about drama. It's essentially this. It, it, the process is the same. So I, it, I'm just going to ignore sort of gladiators and all those kinds of things. They've got very little to do with making a movie. So if you're talking about dramatic content, sh shooting a TV drama and shooting a film is a very similar process. The things you've got to bear in mind is that in TV, you're making for a little screen. Um, and so you use a very different kind of grammar when you are, are, are communicating in that way. Um, and then the, then the audio... Sorry, can you explain grammar? Can, can you explain? I think grammar is used in a slightly different context in this. Yeah, so grammar is, you know, in, in the context of writing, grammar would be, you know, you, you put this word here and a comma here and a word there. It has a certain meaning. You take the comma away, it has a different meaning, right? right. Um, and that's the grammar. So uh, in movies would be you put a close-up here and then after the close-up you cut to a two-shot. Uh, and that has a certain meaning. And if you cut from the close up to a, a very heavy wide uh, on a drone, maybe from above, that has a different meaning. That has a different feel, creates a different feeling in the audience. It has a different communication. The same way as taking a comma out changes the meaning of the sentence, adding a different shot changes the meaning of the scene. And so that's what I mean by grammar. And so cool. yeah, shots are like, think of shots like words and, and punctuation and, and, and music. Um, and all those things need to be constructed very much like you would construct the sentence in order to convey meaning to you. Right. Um, and so the grammar of working for a, for a TV with a small screen and also you receiving the audio uh, stereo and not surround um, and normally through much uh, speakers that are not so great. So you've got all these things going to be taken into account when you're making a, a television drama. And also the budgets are much lower. So you've got to, um, you've got to, uh, it's cheap to shoot dialogue. It's expensive to shoot action. And so TV shows tend to have a lot of dialogue, it's cheaper, and movies tend to have a lot more action or, or, or dynamism, which is expensive and slow to shoot. So those, those are the main differences between, between making films for, 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 for theatre and for, for television. Yes. When, when so, you think of these shows like Egoli, right, and you think, yes, it's they really, talk yeah. so much, and they, go, and they went for like a thousand yeah. episodes, They're like, it's just crazy. Yeah. It's cheap, and that's why it goes to melodrama, because how do you make talking as you just make yeah. it extreme, you know? everybody's sleeping yeah. with everyone else, Makes and sense. everyone's <laughs> having a break every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so interesting now like to, uh, talking to you and listening to you explain these things i just i'm just going back to my school days when we studied uh like videos and and, and films and i think we did strictly ballroom in my year and and right. at the time i was like thinking it's so stupid why, why is our teacher teaching us about studying a mo movie they there's not there's Surely there's not all these things she's talking about to it, you know, but now, like, like you know, yeah. now obviously I'm, I'm like aware of that, but at the time I was like, more to it. So, yeah, but now there's more to it, of course. Yeah, yeah. So much more to it. Just listening to you. Look, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine what your strictly boring uh, <laughs> lesson must be <laughs> like. I, I, I remember those same lessons and they are stupid. They're stupid at this level. People you can take a movie and, and, and put any meaning you want on it. You can say, oh, you know, what they really meant to that scene is this kind of weird kind of interpretation, shall we say. And that stuff I resist because I think what you're really going to ask, the really real question to ask is what, did the, what, is, what does the filmmaker mean? What, what was the filmmaker trying to communicate to you through the scene? And great filmmakers try and communicate a lot of different things to you, not just the content of the scene, the subtext, there's symbolism, there's you know, every little thing you do in a movie, from how you light it to whether it's a, it's a close-up, whether we're this close or this close or this close or this close, all has a different emotional sensibility. That it's it's mm. going to affect you in different ways. And, be, and I can tell you, being a filmmaker, every single angle, every moment, every, every word, um, every image is carefully selected, and they're, and they're carefully selected in a certain order to have an emotional effect on you. And it goes deep. You're asking it at, at, at lots of different levels. And great filmmakers succeed on all those different levels. So you can get into deeply analyzing a film. It becomes very psychological. Um, and there's a reason why films are the greatest art form of the 20th century, though that may have been superseded now by social media. Um, it's because they talk deeply to the psychology of what it is to be alive at a, at a, at a human level, 
the ridiculously human level, <laughs> the cultural level. Um, and, and then, of course, there's just the story, you know, a fun story, and you eat your popcorn and go, hey, I forgot about that, you know, the moment you get to the cinema. But actually, when you get into an analytical mode, even if you're looking at just an action, blah, blah, you know, popcorn movie, um, there is a lot of sophistication that goes into it, way more than you would ever imagine. Yeah. It's interesting, like, I was listening to this guy speak the other day about um, the psychology, as you were mentioning, and and humans, right? Human nature and the psychology, the deeper animal brain within us all. W- yeah. When you, for example, on TV, have like an, a close up or extreme close up of someone's face and their eyes, that is something that you very rarely see in normal day to day interaction. You can see that person's pupils and that, you know, like, yeah. and it's quite, it's like super moving. That's why, that's why you can be be transported into another world when, you, when yeah, you're yeah, watching yeah. a movie, which is quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, not only do you never see that in real life, you then take that and then you, you enlarge it to a huge yeah. screen. <laughs> eyes, but like each eye is like three, four meters yeah. high. You know? <laughs> so, so that is an unbelievable effect. I, you know, when movies first yeah. came out, that was very upsetting to people to suddenly be sort of thrown in their faces, literally. Um, these worlds you know we have one lens through which we see the world and it's quite a it's quite a wide cinemascopic lens if you just look forward you can just see that this is and this and, you, and this is the only lens you'll ever see the world in um the movies just suddenly had all these different lenses and, and, and lens choice by the way is one of the, the biggest choices one makes with every shot that you check which lens are we going to put on we're we going for a fish eye wide lens or we're going for a very long lens uh, and lenses actually see the world quite differently to the way that our eyes do because they choose a particular plane, a focal length to look at. But our eyes can move. It can, our eyes pull focus, literally. So when we mm-hmm. look at a scene, like I'm looking out the window now at Table Mountain, I can, I can either focus on Table Mountain or focus on my feet at the end of the bed. I do it instantly. I don't even do it consciously. I, I just do it by, by moving my attention to my feet and my eyes automatically pull focus. But a camera doesn't do that. A camera must choose to pull focus. So if I framed up the table mountain, my feet in the same frame, I would then have to choose the director. Where do I want that focus? I want it on my toes. Do I want it on the table mountain? Or do I want it somewhere in between? And each of those is a different, it forces you to look at a scene in a certain way. So when, when, it, when a lens frames up, even if it's a similar lens to your eye, it's doing something slightly different. It's forcing you to look at that building in that place. And if I don't want to look at that building anymore, I will then pull focus on the lens and force you now to look at the background or the foreground. And in so doing, have, have a big effect on you. When you watch a movie, pay attention to how focus is pulled within the shot and how that pulls your attention to something. It's one of the, the tools, one of the grammars, is where and how you pull focus, either within a shot or from shot to shot. And it can be, I, I love using that technique. Yeah. Good Lord. I guess you can have decision fatigue at the end of like, one scene. You're like, Christ, do we It'll do blow we your mind. a little bit in that? Or, yeah, there's so many blow things. Initially, there's too much. There's too much to pay attention to. Well, that's why directing is so hard because that's that's just one aspect of it. And there's people yeah. and performance, and never mind how logistically hard it is to shoot a movie. Because now you're taking this crew of sixty people, you're putting them in a street where people are trying to like run, have their daily lives, and here yeah. you are trying to like manage it. And it's, it's <laughs> just the logistics, which is just a, a logistical part of this, a, a nightmare. Um, and, and and you never have the time. And this, you know, the logistics of making movies is, is what actually sinks most first time movie makers because you can never get to the art of it because the logistics is always boning you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You 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 um or well, actually we watched a short film of yours uh Don the Dead End. It was a very powerful uh, oh, movie. Oh, that's so powerful. <laughs> really great, really, really great. And <laughs> but we were wondering like what what why do you why do people make short films and um yeah tell us a little bit about a short film. I, I recommend you've got to make short films and, you, and, and you've got to make a lot of them. And these days there's no excuse because you can make a short film on your cell phone. There are apps to help you make it. There are apps to help you edit it. There are apps to give you the music to, to set to it. There's really no excuse. And it's the only way you're going to learn the craft. And it's the only place you're going to be forgiven for making crap. And short movies can be very arty and they don't have to follow the same. They don't have the same formulas. What do I mean to say? I mean to say they don't have the same demands that a full-length film has. A full-length film is super expensive. You've got to make it in such a way that people enjoy it and are prepared to pay money to see it, otherwise you'll never work again. Um, but short movies don't have those problems. You can go out with your buddies, you can make a short movie, you can, still, you can make a great short movie, 
It's a way for you to experiment, get to know your medium. It's a way for you to show it to other people and see if you're getting positive responses. And maybe if you get enough positive responses, that means it's a career for you. So short movies are absolutely critical. Get out there and have fun and break the rules. This is where you can find how, to, how you want to innovate this, this, this space. Um, and, and I can't recommend it highly enough for anyone who wants to get into movie making. Just go out there and do it. You can do it. You've got a phone right, go and make short movies. That's yeah, cool. that's cool. Just do it, fail quickly, learn, yeah. go again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and do go again. Don't, 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 don't get started from one failure. I see a lot of my friends. See, back in my day, you already only got one shot. Even making a short movie was, the you know, cameras were big and huge, or high quality cameras, these massive, highly expensive million rand machines. And Dead End was actually made with the first HD camera ever in South Africa, and it was a, it was a million rand camera. And for Jeez. me to have, have it for five days was, 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 I had to pull every favor in the book, and it was expensive. And the, the stakes were very high for me on that short film. And, and it was, I, I cringe when I watch it now, but um, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't so bad that I didn't work again, but it was just good enough that people gave me an opportunity to make something else. And that's really what you're hoping it'll do. Nowadays, you don't have those pressures. Um, um, I don't know, what, what was the question again? <laughs> no, 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 there was, there was just a, like, I guess, a comment. But, but talking about how the industry has changed, we obviously have Netflix, Amazon Prime. How has that impacted the industry? It's changed it, disrupted it, improved it, worsened it. Which, which, which one of those or all of the above? Depends who you talk to. I, I, I'm just a... I'm pro change. I'm just, I'm just super optimistic. I, I just don't feel things have moved fast enough. To, I, I still feel like things could be so much more innovative, and that's kind of, and, and ironically, a lot of my movies generally have not been that innovative. But those are the kind of movies I've ended up making. But uh, my desire is to really, really innovate the space. So I just love what Netflix and Amazon are doing, and YouTube are doing, and Vimeo, and all these things that all now have content. You know? It's great for movie makers, firstly, because there's more work. Though I must tell you how overtraded and competitive it is. It's just unbelievable. To get something onto Netflix is unbelievable. Hmm. Um, so so that's, uh, that's where I think innovation's got to come in. You've actually just got to bypass these models and find your own way in. Uh, and certainly if you're a young South African kid or a kid anywhere in the world, in fact, you, you're going to have to find some way to get your voice heard. Uh, and going to Netflix and Amazon, which, which are, I'm not, they're just mainstream now. They're running the show. And so what's happening is, is all the top filmmakers are just going to Netflix, any David Fincher and Hans Scorsese are making shows for those channels. So this is who you're competing against. So you know, before television was a space where, where let's say the lesser directors uh, could have a voice in a time. Now that's no longer the case. All the big directors are now coming down into television or up into television and, uh, because it's now the new space. You know? Netflix is paying more than, than anyone else is for content. Uh, and they've got a great system where they just give you creative freedom and movie makers are just preferring to work in it, you know? Because remember that there's two very different models at work here. A theatrical model, which is the studios use, is a model that only makes money when people go see the film. Where Netflix's model, they've already made their money because you bought your subscription. Hmm. And so you, you, you're released from the pressures of having a box of success. I'll just give you a bunch of money and you go make your film and then you deliver it. Um, hmm. I think that's a... I don't know if that's better. I think it's better. Um, look, Netflix is not making the greatest movies in the world. They're making great television. Uh, and maybe the pressures of the box offices, the competition of the box office, is actually kind of a good thing because it forces you to make content that's decent. Um, mm-hmm. Though now we're seeing that content in the box office is going to be niched and niched and niched into this kind of superhero, sort of big blockbuster and actually quite dumbed down, shall we say, movies, and, which I don't like. I, I feel like box office because of the pressures of having to succeed is not actually the range of content they make is it's, it's very tiny mm-hmm. thank god for netflix and amazon who don't have that problem are now able to make more interesting independent films the independent films are, are having a resurgence through mm. the netflix, like, mm. i like that yeah it's also nice that there's no adverts and stuff i, I prefer just to pay up front and you say look yeah, this is what i pay you, you know yeah. so but much better pay, pay your money and you get your content um, but there's advertising netflix you just don't notice it it's in yeah, the movie. I'm sure. Product, product placement. Yeah, it's true. James Bond driving us to Mark. It's, it's, yeah. it's, product, it's good product that you don't even notice because the character's using the, 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 the brand that you would expect that character to use. You don't even... But you see it and it gets to you and it's doing all the work. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's yeah. as gamified though. Sorry, Gareth, as, as like, you know, Facebook and stuff though. So I'm, I'm almost okay with like, if you've got to throw a product placement in there, fair enough. But it's not using my data of, you know, or maybe they are, I don't know, like 
Sorry, you can't. Saying that I, the only reason I think YouTube and, and, and Facebook get away with the advertising, just so irritating, is they don't have any competitors. Imagine there was a YouTube out there that was as good, but had no adverts. Like you would just be there. Instantaneously, you'd go there. And so just knowing that just means to me that it's unsustainable and they've just got to find another way. Mm. And how, how does like product placement work? Is it the company comes to you or you come to the company because you need some sort of funding? Is it, or is it a bit of both? So the good companies like Ford has a whole division and their job is to put their Ford motor vehicles in films. <laughs> that, there's a guy who's, that is his job. Wow. And so when you want cars for a movie, this is now in America, obviously, not South Africa, you phone him up and just say, hey, we got this movie. What's it about? Okay, cool. And he would be like suggesting cars to you. Know, this guy should drive a Ford Mustang, <laughs> a certain driver. And they give you the cars, they bring you the cars. Um, they have a guy there wrangles the cars for you. Um, and they actually have very few requirements that, that for good people. Like this, the Ford are a particularly great example of how they, how they do it. They don't tell you that you've got to have our Ford logo in for like six seconds. There's none of that. They just, we like your car. Even if, it's, and if, a, even if a car crashes, they don't mind. They, they're very forward thinking about how, how you use their vehicle. They just know that having a vehicle in a movie is cool. That's, and, and that is, it is, you know, where other people are like, okay, you can't crash our cars. Only your hero can drive the car and the villain can't. You know, some people say like that. Um, you know, the content of the movie, you know, if it's edgy content, then we don't want our, our product here. Um, which is fine if it's, you know, kid serial, but really silly if it's, you know, Ford or a car. You know? yeah. um, um, and so that's, so that's how great companies do it. But uh, other companies are all, you know, yeah, we don't want to put our products in your movie. It cheapens our products to have them in movies. So. <laughs> yeah, because you see like lots of Ma like MacBooks, people working on those. Well, Mac is stuff. cool. Mac is great. The Mac just wants their products in, you know, whereas maybe, I don't know whether IBM feel the same way. It's interesting, <laughs> eh? <laughs> so, uh, Don, I would imagine like as a director, the a feature film is sort of the ultimate challenge and um, yeah. you sort of went one step further and wrote and directed your first, one of your first films, um, Dollars and White Pipes. Yeah. Uh, how was that? So tell us maybe a little bit about that film and, and how the experience was of doing both. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was sort of heavily into television at that time. I was doing Gladiators, I was doing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Um, and I was doing a lot, and as a result of that, I was doing all the big shows in South Africa that were multi fam live pageants, you name it. Uh, and I was very dissatisfied. Uh, I was very unhappy doing I was, uh, it was a technical challenge to do it, and then I'd done it, and then a hundred shows later, I was still doing it. Uh, and I hit fatigue, and I, and, I, and I just had to get out of it, and actually resigned from my company that I had started with two friends of mine that were doing all these shows. And um, I just had to do a movie, but I just didn't know what to do. And so I started, I said, okay, let me start reading some scripts. There must be scripts out there, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just reading one god awful script after another. And I didn't consider myself a writer. And I was like, I I, I, I have to do better than this. I must be able to do better than this. And I started writing and I started to realize, you know what, writing is actually harder than doing. Um, and, I, and, I, and I just, I was writing worse scripts than the ones I was reading. <laughs> um, I, geez, I thought, this is really tough. But I, I just kept hammering away at it. I just kept learning. I kept learning. And I started to realize I needed content. Like, if you make shit up out of your brain, all you end up making up is shit that you read and heard before and it just off i can say you're not a very creative person but actually that's the way it should be and how are you going to come up with stuff you've never experienced i mean unless you've got right? that's like literally creating the world out of nothing uh, and so i started to realize that the cliches were just creeping into everything i was writing and i couldn't really avoid it um, and it was a kiss of death because people would read it and go oh this, what's this cliche rubbish and so i started to realize i needed I needed some way to get to content that wasn't coming out of my imagination, which was just full of stuff I'd seen before. Uh, and I met this guy, I met this gangster, and he was this, uh, a colored gangster from Cape Town. I, I met him in Johannesburg. He got out of gangsterism. He was running a restaurant in which I was shooting a TV show. I was shooting an interview show in the restaurant, um, which is a whole other story. But anyway, he was the manager. <laughs> he was the manager, and he, he was very cool. He really helped me put it together because no one had ever shot a talk show in a restaurant before. Um, um, I see Seinfeld copied me now 
comedians and cartoons. <laughs> um, 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 and he, he seemed very interested in it all. And he has a super charismatic guy. Uh, and he, I just thought he was the restaurant manager. So I didn't pay him much mind. And one day, you know, during a break, he said, I, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you my life story. Uh, so I took a big sigh and I kind of said, okay. <laughs> And I sat down at the table with him and he just told me this amazing story of his life and of being a gangster in Cape Town. And being from Cape Town and, 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 and loving the colored, Cape colored subculture, it's this amazing subculture and they have this sing-song voice and they have this very you know, wonderful way of talking to each other. Um, and, and I was in love with that subculture and knew it quite well, better than I thought. But then I was with this guy and he told me, this, and at the end of this hour of him talking to me, I said, I'm going to make a movie about you. And I finally found the original content in this person mm. called Bernie, because wow. it happened to him. And, and I just knew that the, the, this kind of gangster subculture was a huge thing in the world, but gangster movies are massive. But I thought it'd be great to see a gangster movie actually set in a subculture that, was, that I knew, you know, the South African subculture. So I, 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 I then met with him every night for six weeks, and we... He just told me it was life, and I just took all the events of his life, which were just disparate all over the map, and then try to bring it together into a movie. And uh, that's what I did with his help. Wow. And then he became the expert on the film, and I came down to Cape Town, and by hook and by crook, I, I, I entered the script into a competition. It was the first script, and I, by this time, I'd written like five scripts, and everyone had hated all of them. This is, this is my journey, realizing I was just not a, not a great writer, or a cliched writer. <laughs> But, but I had actually got better at structuring the screenplay through that process. Now, here was the first script everyone was loving. It was, God, this script's so amazing, so original, and so, it's so fresh. Uh, and it was only that because of this guy. You know? And um, I won a competition that won me, I, I think I won a million rand with that competition. And then I won an overseas workshop competition. I got to go on this workshop um, with, with some international directors and, and writers. And so this was, this was the journey of the film. And, uh, and then Anand Singh, who's a big producer here in South Africa at that time, and still is, um, got behind it, got some extra money, and Ronnie Atiaka got involved. Um, mm. You know, Ronnie, he, he, he sold Dimension Data for 10 million billion rand or whatever it was, yeah. and he wanted to make movies. Um, but then Ronnie and Anand Singh couldn't see eye to eye, so Ronnie parted ways with us. Anyway, I eventually got 3 million rand together. And, um, which meant I could shoot, and I shot on film, I shot on 16 millimeter films. This was prior to video even. And we came down to Cape Town, and I had 20 days, and I shot this movie. Um, and it was my first movie directing, and it was hell on wheels. Uh, I've never been so stressed. I think I was in a permanent <laughs> state of, of, I had a permanent panic attack for 20 days. For someone who never had a panic attack their whole life. Um, <laughs> I'm exaggerating slightly, but um, it, was, it, was, it was tough. Um, and such a learning experience. And um, yeah, that's how I got my first movie off. That's super cool. Isn't it amazing how one conversation literally can change things? Yeah. Eh? yeah. It's, 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 you've got to be a highly opportunistic as an entrepreneur, and especially as a movie maker. Because those opportunities only pop up, and they pop up in little windows, little conversations, and little experiences. And, and, and suddenly you have this mode of absolute clarity. Like, that's got to be done, you know. Mm. That you've got to make. That's the workable thing. And then you've got to do it. And then you've got to follow through. And it's the follow through. I think people have those little epiphanies every five minutes. You know, uh, I can come up with a couple of good movie ideas every week. But, you know, the one that you follow through on all the way is, is, is mm. where the real commitment. You know, mm. You've got to have the commitment to do that, you know. You can't just decide to have a podcast. Hey, we'll call it Ridiculously Human. Oh, that's amazing. But then you've actually got to, <laughs> Do it, you know, and that's as you know, it's a massive undertaking that yeah. I'm sure you guys were prepared for. And um, uh, and the, in making anything, making a movie particularly, because it's just so arduous to do, it's so mm. difficult. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, so so you you're not shy about tackling tough subjects like you just spoke about, like corruption, gangsterism, and the dark underbelly uh, yeah. of South Africa. Is this? Because it's something you have a personal interest in, or you just think it's topical and all like make a good movie. I'd like to say that I that I I have a conscience, <laughs> <laughs> but I think all I really want to do is make a good movie, um, and I think that's okay. I think there's something about making a good movie that that resonates that does all the things you first mentioned. I, I think it's the wrong way to go about it to think well, I want to make a difference or so I want to. 
making 14 films that speak to a truth. You know, right now I'm making a movie about child sex trafficking. And I do walk around thinking, oh, I'm making an important movie here. Um, but really, that's not the right attitude because that, that, that generally leads to poor movies. And really what you want to make is a super entertaining story that tangentially brings awareness to these issues. It just brings it into the zeitgeist, brings it into the conversation. I think that's the best anyone can hope to do, even somebody who's sitting there at the platform protesting you know, um, or making a very kind of socially aware documentary. Because the problem with that is that if you've got a, a mission or you've got a belief like, oh, gangsterism's bad, um, and you make a movie about that, you're going to make a bad movie, I can guarantee it, because gangsterism is not bad. Now, that might be a controversial thing to say. It's not bad, it really isn't. And you've got to find out why it isn't bad. And when you meet gangsters, when you go actually and meet the people committing these crimes and get into their world, you discover these are not bad human beings. They're human beings who've made a choice about the world. You've decided the world, I don't want to get into the arguments about gangsters particularly, but it's around the fact that when the world is not serving you, you make your own world, and you make your own mm -hmm. set of rules. And there's as much, much honor in their own set of rules that happen to be counterculture. Um, and so you've got to find in every, I've got to find from, when I'm making this film about child sex traffickers, I've got to find why, I've got to humanize the child sex trafficking. In fact, one of my key characters is a guy who went and snatched kids off the street and actually sold them into, uh, mm -hmm. sold them. And so I've got to find the human angle. Um, I've got to find what made him human and what, you know, he's, he's not just an evil psychopath. Because you make the movie about what an evil psychopath he is. It's just telling you what you already know. You know? I make a movie about, hey, actually, this guy's a human being who made, who's making some very interesting choices. Suddenly, you're leaning forward and going, oh, mm. find out about this. And in so doing, you will find something out about human nature and your own nature and your own evil. Mm. Mm. Because we are evil and we are good. And so, yeah, that dichotomy is going to be reflected. And that's what movies do. Wow. I think, you know, every bad person in history was a little boy once, was someone's neighbor once, you know, they, they're just normal people. And then at some level, you know, there's a, there's a slow transition, but if you can bring that person out, I mean, it's, you know, any one of us could have been friends with that person in theory, you know, we always think that they're big evil characters but it's not necessarily like that in every situation and that's the interesting part because we've all kind of ca can see a glimpse of maybe ourselves at one aspect of that person do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. i don't know if you listen to the hardcore history podcast if you don't you should yeah um, yeah definitely uh, you know there's a thing about hitler and, and and how he was actually a war hero in the first world mm. the first world war was one of the most brutal terrible awful places and he was a, a hero, you know, who, who, who managed to withstand shell shock and never sort of wilted at the front. And I mm. think any of us standing at that front would have just been running with a tail between our legs. So this is a guy who was a war hero who went to be one of the most despicable human beings in the history of time. And, and that's hard to reconcile, you know, and it's movies' jobs to reconcile it. It's, mm. it's, and unfortunately, social warriors can't do that because they've got, to, they've got to stick a flag up for their side. Movie makers should never have to do that. They should have to argue both sides every time. Good movies argue that both sides of good and evil and bad and, 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 and its opposite must be done so that we can balance society, you know, especially these days, you look at America, just how polarized everybody is, even here in South Africa now, the Zuma camp, the anti-Zuma camp. The only way you're going to reconcile those two camps is to, is to show them to each other, the true faces. And good art, good movies, good theater can do some of that work. Oh, it's got a big job uh comedy and all these different different uh, yeah and comedy's so, the best i mean look yeah. what trevor Noah's doing you know look that social commentary is is, is people trust it more than news now frankly it's like mm. <laughs> this uh the bill maher and what trevor Noah's doing and what uh stuart did before him and colbert are doing um they, they're satirizing this is what the truth this is what comedy should really be is, is, a, is a satire of politics mm -hmm. Or did you see the true face of politics to look beneath, force you to look beneath the hood and able you to look beneath the hood in a way that doesn't offend you so that even a Republican can laugh at Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Maher does a great job of, of some of that. That's for a sure. great job. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> Religious was pretty funny. I must say. Yeah, yeah, great movie. <laughs> it's uh it's really fascinating for us to sort of get a glimpse into the, the, the you know, the big, the world of the movie sets and, and that kind of thing. And, 
Um, is, is there like a hierarchy that's happening between actors and the crew and director and producer and, and uh, how does it all sort of fit together? It's the last bastion of the dictator. <laughs> the director is a dictator. Uh, and um, you have all the power. You have the power of a dictator. I'm like Muhammad I'm Gaddafi. Or <laughs> name, name your dictator. But um, they say the most efficient form of government is in fact a benign dictator. Because the great thing about being a dictator is it's very efficient. If one person makes a decision, everyone follows it. If you make uh, malevolent decisions, then everything falls to pieces. But if you make benign decisions, you can actually get things done really quickly. You can really create something amazing. And so all the best directors I know are benign dictators. Um, they definitely top the totem pole. Um, and they uh, are able to get the best out of everyone below them. And, but they do this by being having a singular vision and not allowing anyone else's vision to impede. Um, so that's, we're talking about the auteur. There are directors who don't work like that, who are malevolent dictators, who come in and say, shut the up, stand there, do what I say, don't ask questions. And some of them make great movies. This is, the, this is the irony because people sometimes want to follow. They want to be told this. And then the other directors are very collaborative and they want to hear everyone's point of view and they're able to bring points of view together. Um, but you can do that to a point. I, 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 when I started out trying to be quite collaborative, but it's difficult because at, at, at the end of the day, someone's going to make a decision and actually you water down a vision by having too many inputs. So actually the dictatorship works slightly better. The benign dictatorship where you initially caught a lot of opinions and then as you zero into actually shooting this thing, you start to take over and say, no, no, but this is it, guys. And you keep everyone on track. You keep everyone on track. And that can be mm -hmm. fractious, but you're a lot of artists together, composers and musicians and actors who also have big egos and strong feelings about how this thing should go. Um, and, and for me, that fell apart when I went overseas because I didn't have the same kind of creative control. I wasn't able to exercise my dictatorship. There were a number of other dictators in the mix. Um, some benign, <laughs> some, some malevolent, right? I had nine producers above me who were, who were, who were who are my bosses, including the star of the movie, who should actually be under me, so actually over me. Um, and Gary Oldman, who's, you know, who, no matter where you put him, is going to be more senior to me because of just who he is in the world. <laughs> um, you know, no one's going to listen to you over Gary Oldman. Nobody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the director or what the fuck you are. Um, yeah. So you've got all these dictators all, all, all wanting to make a good movie, but all feeling like they know best creatively. Um, and if you guys worked in advertising, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so at the end of the day, the best movies are made when one person does the whole job, writes it, directs it, pulls everyone into singular vision, keeps everyone's spirits up because that's the way the benignness is important, keeping everyone on the same page, but happy and feeling like they, that they have some creative expression within confined lanes. Um, and this is why it's so hard to make a good film. It's, to, 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 it's very fine for me just to say that what I've just said, but then to actually do that is virtually impossible. Mm. Uh, the wheels are going to come off on that train a number of times. And, and how you manage, how you manage those crashes are, are, are important. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think everyone in every sort of scene or scenario generally needs a a good leader to take things forward and yeah. get a good result. But just make sure that everyone's kind of on board and and you know that you're all working towards the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Someone's going to at some point. Someone's going to tell you what to do. Yeah. This is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to do it, and this is what you're going to do in the in the wheel. Um, and 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 it's hard sometimes to do that in a, in a cool way, and, and and when the super stress of a film sets, there's not there's not a lot of time for niceties for me to make you feel mm. good about yourself, as well as telling you what to do. And so yeah, there needs to be a lot of trust, and, and, and yeah, it's why movie sets are notoriously fractious, and that's why there's so much wonderful gossip about how movie sets fall to pieces. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, and so it's, it's a tremendously challenging environment. So what do you like? It's the art and science. So yeah. it's, it's a collision yeah. of art and science. It's like, it's the most unregimented thing that resists all kinds of dictatorship versus the most regimented thing. It's a science, which is rules and art, which is about freedom of expression, sort of colliding. You know? And no wonder it's such a fuck up. Most, <laughs> movies, most movies are actually pretty shit. Most yeah. movies, including, including my own. Not when you get it right. Yeah, it's just so hard to get right. So hard to get that collision to actually me to meld. Wow. Super yeah. interesting, eh? Yeah. It's quite a big machine, yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, it's so, ridiculous. Yeah. So, so like, do you ever get any downtime being a director, like, on the film? And, and also, what do the p other people do on downtime? 
Um, in the actual making of the film, in the intense phase, which is the pre-production, so you're pre in pre-production for about six to 12 weeks, then you shoot for typically six or seven weeks, and then you're in post-production for six months to a year. Um, so that's, that's the filmmaking journey. During the pre-production shooting phase, I'm balls to the wall 24-7. I, I, I've learned to really pace myself, so I make sure I get my eight hours to 10 hours sleep um, every night. Yeah. When I'm filming, you can't do that. So it's like six or seven that I'm filming. But I make sure I get that. And I make sure I manage my stress levels through it. Because to be creative, this is where the collision of art and science or art and reality comes in. <laughs> be creative. You've got to be relaxed. You've got to be able to think. You can't jump to decisions. You've got to be considered. You've got to take in all the points of view. And you've got to make one decision. And you've got one chance to do it. The camera's going to roll. You're going to do the scene. And then it's done. And you've moved on. You've spent your 100,000 rand shooting that scene, or a million rand, or a million dollars, or whatever it was. And there's no going back. And so that's under that extreme pressure, people break. And then their creativity breaks. They could be this incredibly creative person, with an amazing vision. But when they hit reality, it falls to pieces. And this is why a lot of great people make bad films, or people who made one good film can't make a bad film. Why well, I've made bad films. Um, it's just things conspire. Uh, against people. So to manage all of that is, is incredibly, incredibly hard. And I have almost zero time while I'm trying to do that. And then between movies, I have years between movies. And then I, I'm, I'm a hustler. I'm hustling. I have nothing but free time. I can sit in my bed on a Sunday morning and chat to you guys. <laughs> uh, I am actually an editor at the moment. But, um, you know, and I can, I can have to be creative and come up with the next idea. And So it's, it's huge amounts of doing nothing with huge amounts of activity. I guess there's a degree of stress in the doing nothing too, like that you must hustle, that yeah. you must create, that you must. Yeah. I'm not happy if I'm not creating. I'm just not happy. I can't be a happy human being. I don't care what fucking happens. I win the lottery, I won't be happy. <laughs> um, I need to be creating something out of nothing. Even if it's shit, I just need to be doing that process. Do you I've consider yourself an artist then in that, in that regard? Yeah. And I think it's true of all human beings. I, I can't believe it's not true of anyone. And I believe everything's art. Podcasting's art. Uh, doing your books is an art. Choosing what outfit to wear every day is an art. Choosing where to live is an art. Choosing what to eat is an art. And so, you know, if you're not being creative in those dimensions, you will gradually sink into depression. You're just doing the same thing every day, eating the same food, putting on the same t-shirt. Eventually, you'll just descend into depression. Yeah, you're so right, but I think everything is an art as well, definitely. And especially, yeah, when you start understanding different industries and different things in more detail, you're like, wow, there really is an art and science to these things. Um, yeah, you know, I, I used to do a bit of bodybuilding and I used to go like bodybuilding is a proper art. You know, these guys are, cool. they are trying to make their bodies like look yeah. absolutely symmetrical, but this muscle must like pop gotcha. out here and then you've got to, at the same time do your posing and you know like it's just it's a total art but most people just look at those guys and go those guys are just big morons you know but actually yeah, you know yeah. they're very creative people in, in the same but, look anything can be moronic and anything can be artistic you know, there, there are mm. bodybuilders who are moronic and there are movie makers who are moronic and but those who those who choose to make it an art and it's it's taking yourself out of your comfort zone i've always you know we always try and be comfortable but actually com comfortableness leads to depression um, and so you've got to keep challenging yourself in those levels to be happy. Mm. I think it's a great way to live your life. It's to, to just live, make every decision a fun, curio curious, artistic mm. thing. And yeah, mm. just, I think it's actually great advice just for day-to-day -day life for everybody. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And, uh, but yeah. So you were recently uh, the director of a, a sort of a big Hollywood action movie oh. called Hunter Killer, which starred... Gerard Butler and Gary Oldman, as you mentioned earlier. Um, but leading up to the film, the, um, the US Navy took you and Gerard sort of underway for three days on a nuclear sub submarine, as far as I understand. Yes. Um, what was that like? Mad. <laughs> mad. I mean, nobody runs something more efficiently than the American military. <clears throat> so and it was such an interesting thing for me to, to experience the American military firsthand. So I arrive in Pearl Harbor which is the most secure military base in the world. Um, if you think about it, there are 12, I think there are 18 nuclear reactors 
in Pearl Harbor at any one time because all the submarines mm -hmm. are nuclear reactors and all the aircraft carriers are nuclear reactors. Wow. At any one time, there's 18 of them parked and the rest of them are at sea. So it's, it's the most nuclear uh, active place in the world um, and the most secure in the world. Uh, and I, I was going to go on one, on the most classified machine in the whole of the American Army, Navy, mm -hmm. the submarines, the most classified because they are the one war machine you can deploy without the enemy knowing you've deployed it. Hmm. Um, because it's under war, you can't see it, can't be detected. And so they go to great lengths to, to keep everything on the submarine secret, how it works, what it looks like, everything about it is, is, is classified information. And so to get onto a submarine is no small thing as a movie maker, as, a, as someone who's oh, wants you to show it to the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of reverse thing. But the American Navy have a problem. And the, and the one problem is they cannot get people to sign up for the, for the submarine corps because it's the least glamorous and most secretive. So yeah. you know about it. Yeah. You're not out on an aircraft carrier with, with the horizon in this little <laughs> claustrophobic coffin <laughs> bomb. <laughs> um, <laughs> So they have that problem. And they're also this sort of transparency, you know, it's like people, this, the world is showing each other more of themselves and, and, and they're kind of open to that and they can see how it works well with their allies and even with their enemies to just show them a bit about what they're doing. So they have these two agendas and, and, and they see they, they, have, they also have a, a military wing whose job it is to put their machines into movies for these two reasons. So the Navy wanted to make a movie about the latest Virginia class nuclear submarines, a brand new three story high, 150 meter long submarine. Wow. It doesn't have a periscope. There are no periscopes, no periscope, you remember from the movie that doesn't have, it's all electronic. Um, it's still a nuclear reactor, so which is still very sensitive. Um, and they wanted to put that in the movie and demonstrate it to the world and to get people to want to be crew for those machines. Wow. And so they invited us to Pearl Harbor to, to give us the experience. Um, the script had been written. I, I came on board after the script had been done. The script had been written with the Navy, uh, uh, together with the Navy. Um, and so they were very behind and they were backing it. And they wanted it to be authentic and real as possible. And in order to do that, they put us on the submarine. And they took us underway for three days. Um, and they actually ran the drills of the script. So each thing that happened in the script, they would run it on, as though it was happening on the actual submarines, the little wow. submarine drills. You can actually shoot torpedoes, but not real torpedoes. They shoot water slugs. So they fill the torpedo tube with water. No ways. Shoot that water slug and it shoots and sounds and I actually was wow. off the exactly like a real torpedo. Um, and they ran the drills underwater for us, which was amazing. Wow. Um, and then we got to meet the crew and hang out to them. There's no cell phone signal down there. So there's no cell phones, no laptops. There's no communication with the outside world. They purposely are uncommunicable with, so there's no, you can't talk back to Washington when you're in a submarine, you're alone in this thing. Wow. Jeez. Um, and it's only when they surface, and they don't surface because that's when they can be seen by enemies. So, they sound so a submarine captain to this day is the only autonomous war captain in the world. So submarine captains are operating autonomously. They do not communicate with Washington. They, they get a mission, they wow. go out and they do it. Um, so it's a very unique world to live in, a very dangerous world. Because again, there are no portals, obviously, so it's all done with sonar, and they all listen. And anything, like an underwater cliff can just come out of nowhere. And you've got to, you've got, the sonar guy's got to see it, know what it is through just through listen. And there's no active sonar either. They're not pinging. They're not going ping and returning the ping, yeah. because that gives away your position. So they're just listening to the noises in, in the water. Just from the noises, they're to work out the whole topography. And then they can not only navigate, they can chase other something. Wow. Um, so it's just an incredible piece of kit. Uh, so that was just amazing to go down and be in this very, and when you're in there, it's incredible because it's, it's not made for it to be beautiful. It's not made to be a Maserati, you know, it's an industrial <laughs> machine. You know? Every, people need a screen. They're just like, we need a screen here. So they just screw, stick a screen. Oh, we need a box here. Screw, stick a box here. So it's just boxes and screens, just like the art and girders and bars. And it's just not it's sort of beautiful, but it is beautiful in its own way. Um, and so just, just seeing all of this, and I knew that I had to, it was so complex, I knew I could never build a set that was even remotely as decent as a real submarine. So I, 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 we had to build some sets, obviously, film in a real sub. Um, but I, I felt I had one day of filming in the real submarine, and I had to intercut that with my set, so I had to look exactly like a real submarine. So that was oh, the goal, wow. to build the set so that I could intercut them with the real sub. Huh. What a challenge. was born of that three-day trip. 
It's amazing. Wow. Chief is so interesting, isn't it? It's just once you go into all these other worlds. Um, wow. it must have been scary. Was it scary? Like, was it freaky being down there actually underwater and stuff? We joked. I mean, when you, it's so stable under the water because you don't catch, there's no, there's no, when you're on top of the water, so the sun's pushing out on top, you get the, the wobble like you would on a boat. But when you go under, it's just rock solid. We kept joking that they just popped on the beach. <laughs> All of knowing that you had to see, because knowing to see, right? It's just a sonar screen going ping pong. I mean, it could be, could be as far as you know, it could be, you, know, you could be still in the port. Um, oh, but uh, it wasn't scary. It was claustrophobic. I mean, I, I, I yeah. slept with 18 guys in one room. Maybe three bunks, and I'm two meters tall, so I can not really fit. Um, uh, and so it can get a bit much. And after three days, I was getting a little, little, little depressed. 110 wow. men. 110? Yes. Yeah, and I, sure. I, I, I had to duck wherever I went. I couldn't, I couldn't stand straight. So Jeez. Three, three days of not standing straight is not fun. How do guys like eat? Do they, you know, is it, do they have chefs down there, or how does and it look? Yeah, yeah, it's full of, it's, 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 They can do everything. Huh. They, 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 they make their own air by electrolysis from, the, from taking oxygen hydrogen atoms out of the water. So they make their own air. They make their own water by, by purifying the water that they're in. Wow. They, they, they can go and they, can, they only have to refuel every 30 years. <laughs> the only thing they run out of is food. It's the only limitation they have. But they have these fridges which they pack the food in and then they, um, they have chefs and cooks and they, they keep the food at a super high level. It's all about morale. The morale is all yeah. about food. So they, the food is amazing. It's incredible. Um, but they run out of food. They say they go on a long mission like after six months they'll run out of food and then they're on rations and then it's not fun. Jeez, then everyone's so grumpy as. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, wow. What was it? I mean, I know also Gary Ullman was a sort of maybe childhood hero or hero of yours. What is it like working with him and, and meeting him? Well, you know, the way Hollywood w- works is it's a bit sad. You don't really get to meet them. So Gary had like four days in his schedule for us. So he, he, he arrived on, uh, I think it was like six days actually. So he arrives, he's got one day before filming. So I literally meet him the day before I film with him. I've had a phone conversation. So I have a phone conversation with him. Hey, we talk about the film and the script. He's got some ideas. I got some ideas. I have this phone. Or I start with him for one. Or I, I, I try to have a, like a lunch with him, which never happens with Um uh, And then he arrives on that day. In that one day, he's got to get all his wardrobe and costume done. He's got to do all his makeup done. Um, he's got to meet all the producers and stuff. And then I, I, I probably sat with him for like two hours. Because I'm busy directing the movie. It's not that I have a day to go and sit with him. So I spent a couple of hours with him the day before filming, um, and then we filmed it. He's on set, you know. And now it's, I'm directing, uh, which is really unideal because we're still, you know, we're still uncomfortable. You know, we just—it's like two guys have just met each other, and you still have that awkwardness of, of the first meeting, and, and you never really get over that. You're like you start to get over it on day the last day of shooting. <laughs> um, yeah. It was different with Jerry. I mean, Joe Batley had a lot of time with him, but but. Uh, because he was a producer of the film and he also was a writer of the film. So he was, he was very involved. But Gary was just, you know, he came in, I met him, it was a whirlwind. The fact the movie was really shooting. And he came <laughs> on set and I said, you do this stuff. Like, okay, whatever. Okay, cool. Great. You know. Every now and again, I go up to Gary and say, because, um, you know, he, he, he likes to go big, Gary. likes to go big performance. <laughs> and I say, Gary, maybe you want to do one like a little, I don't know, a little more, a little more held back. And he'd go, I don't know, Donovan, it's World War Three, God damn it. World War Three. I was like, okay, let's go again. <laughs> oh my God, I could just imagine, like, here's the South African guy, like, you know, just telling us, <laughs> to calm yeah. down, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and inherently doesn't trust me because, you know, who am I? You know, I don't have a huge track record of movies. He's very respectful and very nice to me. He was very respectful. He was cool. He was collaborative. And great guy. I liked him a lot. No key. Um, only lost his shit once because you know, air conditioning broke down in the studio. Um, <laughs> he was fine. I can't work with fucking air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> and Gerard, was that was that challenging having him as the producer and as an actor, as you sort of alluded to earlier? Very, 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 very challenging because he had a very clear idea of how he wanted the movie to look and feel. Um, and he's the star of the movie as well. So, you know, he's just, yeah. he's, he's so, you know, it's his face up there. And he's got a very strong personality. He's made 45 films. I've only made five. 
um, and none, none of them Hollywood films. And so he, he would always defer to his own judgment, you know, before deferring to my judgment. Even though he was a very, very nice guy, Jerry. He's a very friendly, very collaborative, very cool guy. But he's, you know, like any star, like he is the quintessential Hollywood star. He's pumping from the serotonin and dopamine. He's like, he's looking at the testosterone, as he should have, you know. He's got so much, he's got so much positive reinforcement. I've never seen uh, girls just, uh, uh, it's crazy to see how girls react to him. It's, it's just like, you know, crazy. But they must do something to his feedback, internal feedback system. So the guy's just pumping full of all the good things. Wow. Um, and he exudes it, and he is a Hollywood star, and he is that sort of a hyper personality. And so he's hard to manage at that level. My job is, I always say my job wasn't so much directing Jerry as it was wrangling him. I was wrangling him. <laughs> um, but I, I had a great experience with him. Like when Jerry wanted to like create together, like I felt we really did awesome stuff. But every now and again, he'd get into a place where he just could only see it one way and it was his way. And we'd fight about that. I mean, we'd have arguments about what. Mm. Um, but I always have to defer to him in the end because he was the star and the producer. So, so it was, it wasn't, it, we didn't argue and fight. We probably had like one or two fights the whole, you know, two year process together. So, and most of those fights were actually quite productive fights. Like we were arguing over what we believed in creatively. You know, I wasn't telling him he was a dick. He wasn't telling me I was a dick. <laughs> um, I thought that might've been the subject. Um, <laughs> um, but it was tough because he had such a clear idea in his head but wanted to give me my space too, you know, because he's a good guy. He wants to give me my chance. And so it, it was an uncomfortable push me pull you until we found a space together. I actually thought we were a great team. I thought he was very strong in areas that I'm not that strong in. And I was very strong in areas that I thought he wasn't that strong in. And so I thought we were, we were a great team. Um, we're, we're, we're the movie, f yeah, I mean, the, the movie, you know, obviously it got mixed reviews um, and, and mixed results. So, you know, you, you've got to ask yourself, you know, to what degree did our relationship responsible for that? Or did we actually make the best movie we could have made? You know, those are hard questions to answer. Um, and it wasn't ideal. For me, movie making is going to be one person's vision ultimately. And then I had to tell her that was mm -hmm. not, it was my vision, it was Jerry's vision. It was the other producer's vision, who, who kind of didn't have the backbone to stand up to Jerry most of the time, except for one or two guys. Um, there, were some there was one amazing producer on the film um, who was just my ally and his, just great um, but there are a lot of points of view and no one could finally agree that my point of view was going to rule the day and so what happened was I, my point of view would rule for like this week and the next week Jerry's point of view would rule and then mm. the next week someone else's point of view would rule. And, and the movie would then morph along this, these lines it's really not good for the film finally and I think didn't do the movie any good whether that would ultimately change how well the movie performed I don't know, I don't know. maybe it would be better worse who who knows? But ultimately, it was better when one person decides. I think. Sure, sure, bud. It's so I'm, interesting, I'm man. That again. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I'm, interesting. I'll never be subservient like that again. I'll yeah. ever do another Hollywood movie, it'll be I want final cut. I want full control. If you don't want to give me that, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's well, important lessons, eh? Yeah. Like it's a, school fees. Yeah. I got wrapped hard over the knuckles making that film. Hard. The teacher gave me a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've learned my lesson. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's good, but it's good. That's the only way to learn, isn't it? You know, I was, I was reading something the other day that said, as a human, you are the, um, the result of all your mistakes. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what you are in a way, you know, because you, hopefully you learn from a lot of those. It's, I guess it's one, one part of who you are, or how you are. Yeah. And movie making is, and talking about mistakes, movie making is the most humbling thing I've ever done. Whenever I felt like vid cut and I've got an ego and I know what I'm, I, I know what I'm doing now. I, I've got this movie thing licked now. <laughs> I've just made my. I've just made another movie, and I've just sat in the edit and watched my first rough cut. And I think, She's got a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and I was feeling so good prior to watching. I was like, "Yeah, let's watch this." And, you know, I just felt like I, I nailed it. And then you realize, "Oh my God, it's so much more hard I could go to do before this thing." Yes. Started. You know, ah. it's just so humbling at that level all the time. Yeah. So yeah. That's great self-awareness though as well, isn't it? It's yeah. so important. You've got to have it, otherwise you won't survive it. You know? For sure. You'll just, you, you end up thinking you, you don't know what you're doing. You know? In any difficult endeavor, you're going to encounter your dark self and you're going to see, you're going to mm -hmm. feel like an imposter and you're going to see where all your shortcomings will be brought into sharp relief, not only for yourself, but for everyone else watching alongside you. Yeah. Yeah. 
put down when those interview directors, man. What the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, but there's some there's some kind of stark awareness when you're watching it on on a screen and and like it's it's a real mirror for for your, your where you're at, I suppose. Wow. Yeah, and it's stark when you like looking to your right at the people you've invited in to watch it with you because you need <laughs> it. They like look at their watch, right? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> classic. classic yeah so so but it's i mean it's been amazing chatting with you seriously like I, I reckon we could spend hours chatting to you it's just so, so <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. um but, but ma- maybe you can just tell us uh like sort of what you're currently up to what we can expect from you going forward and also like how people can get in touch with you if they want to yeah, it's, it's a great question. Look, I had, I had a very tough experience making this Hollywood film. Um, it, it did tell me, and then I went straight into another film. So I'm making a film about child sex trafficking, which is very important to me. And I think it's going to be amazing when I get it right. Um, but ultimately, what I want to do is innovate the movie space. I think what AI, a, what AI is doing in movies is fascinating. There's a little short movie that an AI wrote, and humans try mm-hmm. to interpret what it wrote. It's actually kind of hilarious uh, and clunky, but also amazing. And now, I, I, I'm so interested in innovating the space and bringing artificial intelligence into it. And, 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 and I'm trying to create an app at the moment where, where that actually it's an artificial intelligence algorithm that, that, that talks to you and asks you the right kind of questions when you try to make a piece of film. Um, and actually, so is, your, is your AI collaborator? And so I'm really mm. interested in innovating in that space. And, 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 and yeah, I, I feel like AI is a great way to keep you fresh. You know? it's, it's drawing for it's. It's a crazy world, you know, um, uh, well, not so crazy world, depending on what you think AI is. Um, and so I just, I want to innovate, the, I want to innovate the medium. I want to do it in amazing ways, but I also just want to tell great stories. So just trying to bring all that together. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Everything's open-ended for me. And I, I, I want to, I don't want to say this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm not going to do. I want to surprise myself in that way. Keep it fresh now. Um, okay. If you want to hold me, you can check out Facebook. I've got a, I've got a page that Georgie uh, uh, keeps up for me. All those posts are actually Georgie's voice pretending to be my voice. I should not <laughs> um, but so I have a page. You can check me out. You can send a message. Okay. Cool. And actually, Thanks. actually, we should just mention Georgie's page there as well. The offside. It's uh, oh, yeah, yeah, while you're on Facebook, definitely check it out. It's it's hilarious. She's hilarious, articulate, and uh, definitely. Uh, also pretty good, eh? <laughs> got a satirical, dry voice that you might just enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, Don, just before we finish off, we 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 like to ask everyone our um of our guests a question, and the question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Just being able to just be mad and crazy. We all, you know, we're all so regimented. We all just behave in these sort of cultural norms that we think are somehow how we should behave or normal normality. You just got to step out and be mad and crazy. I sometimes do things alone. It's probably showing too much, but um, <laughs> I might take a psychedelic substance or two and just go mad, you know, and just be crazy and, and be creative in, in, a, in a spontaneous ways. And out of that comes magic um, because you've, you've got to somehow interface with your subconscious and, and being normal and being staid is you, 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 you're suppressing your subconscious. If you want to get inside your subconscious, you've got to, uh, get crazy and get mad, and that's what being ridiculously human is to me. I love it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's, it's, it's way too easy just to be normal and just be every day, and, and yeah, the, the true creativity really comes from from the average and just doing the normal day to day things. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, just wanted to take a moment, Donovan, just to say, listen, thank you so much for your time here today. We Loved having a chat to you. As Gareth said, we could have literally chatted to you for another hour, even just another hour, just about the submarine. But we'll, you know, we'll come back to that. <laughs> but uh, no, really, like you, you know, the work you're doing is is great. You're representing South Africa. You're creating great things. You are a very creative person, and uh, your work is uh, just wonderful to watch. And obviously, you know, you've got some great big ideas on the way, and it's just super exciting to see what you're up to. Um, so thanks for giving us a little insight into the world that uh, that you're in, and uh, I'm sure so many people are going to have a lot of value from that because it's uh, it's life and it's work and it's movies. There's a big uh, sort of uh, intertwining of these things in in day to day world. So um, great great chat today. Thanks. Awesome. Been such fun, guys. This is a great thing you guys are doing. Give it up.
Yeah, thanks, thank bud. And just quickly for me, I just wanted to also say thank you. Uh, it was so it, like, it's so fascinating chatting to people in different industries. Like you just, yeah, cool. you can look at it with your own eyes and go, yeah, this is kind of what it's about. But it's not until you actually either go and speak to the person or try it yourself that you realize, okay, there's so much more to it. And just listening to what you were saying about directing and about what goes into films and, and the different layers that are involved in it, like the psychology and the storytelling and the, you know, the placements and the, the angles and, and the music and all these things. It's like, wow, there's actually so much to it. And you, you've got to really, you've actually really got to sit down and watch things properly. You know, and or, or maybe not even sometimes. Maybe that's the point: is you just sit there and, and subconsciously you pick these things up. Yeah. It's it's probably yeah. the probably both. But but yeah. thanks for giving us that different perspective. Right. And, and like, it's a I mean, the, the whole yeah. art of, of movie making is to be seamless and for you not to see how complicated it is. <laughs> and so, <laughs> a lot of people are surprised to learn how, how incredibly tough and complicated and how the aspects they are to putting a film together. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super cool. And then just like Craig said, you know, being South African and you know, taking on tough subjects is important. Um, and also just uh, helping us be curious is important. Yeah. And thanks for the chat, but it was really, it was really awesome. And I really appreciate it. It was just Pleasure. Uh, yeah, giving me a new, a new, a new sense of, of, of different things. That's for sure. So it was great chatting with you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Cool, man. Cool. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. Gotta be quick.